I heard the announcement about uh, the uh, Financial Peace series study, and if uh, I want to encourage you to be a part of that, especially if you're a young person. Don't wait till you're my age. It's too late then, and there is no peace. But uh, do it while you're young, and when you get to my age, you can have some peace in life. And there's great, great guidance through that. Hope you'll partake of it. Uh, just a little note, I, last few times I've been scheduled to preach, people have come up to me and have said, you know, we're praying for you. I can't tell you how much that means. That is, wow, that's just like, that's so powerfully therapeutic when a preacher hears that. It lifts his spirit because our greatest fear is to try to do this in and of and by ourselves because we know failure is guaranteed. And when you say you're praying for us, and we know we're praying for us as well, but when our prayers are coupled with your prayers, it has an energizing and faith-lifting impact upon us. So please do pray for us. Pray for all of our church leadership, our pastors, our music ministry, and uh, everything that takes place uh, in this beautiful God-given facility. That's almost paid for. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? God has been so good. Well, um, this is a fun church. Uh, it has been a great privilege and joy for Carolyn and me to be a part of some really fun churches. I, and that's why I love this church so much. You remind me of the church we pastored in Sioux City, Morningside Assembly, for a pretty good length of time. And those people knew how to have fun, and so do you. Um, and Friday night at our seniors' uh, meeting, we, we, we just had a great time. We had wonderful food and fellowship. We have such a good time. I, I feel sorry for you if you're, if you're under 50. You just don't know what you're missing. And if you think once you hit 50 or 60, you know, you just, you just kind of just just fading into the whatever you fade into, <laughs> you're in for a big surprise. We, we know how to have fun. And we had a great deal of, of fun uh, Friday night. And, and I learned some things about our, our church. I, I learned how God has given such incredibly rich talent throughout the ranks of this fellowship. And we saw some of that talent on display Friday night. I mean, woodworking and stained glass creations and dressmaking and art and quilting and uh, singing and playing instruments. And the theme that Friday night was New Hope's, New Hope's Got Talent. And boy, do we. And we think there's still some rich reservoirs of undiscovered talent that will soon be discovered. And it's great. I also learned Friday night that uh, New Hope is a very, not only a talented group, but a very merciful group as well. You see, I sang, and I played my guitar for the, like the first time outside of my house. And uh, I was so nervous, and I got through the night. No one threw anything at me. They're just a couple of salt shakers, but I'm not worried about They were small. They were small salt shakers. Um, so it was, it was a wonderful night, and, and not, not very many people walked out on me. Just I, I didn't count them all, but it wasn't very many. This church knows how to extend mercy. Of course, I shouldn't be surprised by that because I, you've been doing that to Pastor Weaver for years. And, uh, but it was so confirmational and to be able to accept that personally. So I, I want to thank you all for that. And I'm going to remember that uh, as I preach tonight. And I'd like to look in Psalm 92. And if you have a version of the Bible in your hand other than the King James Bible, don't even bother looking it up because it's only going to confuse you, okay? But the King James Bible, I'm using it because it says what I want it to say. I like it. It's Psalm 92 and verse 10. And in the latter part of that verse, well, let's read it all. David said, but my horn, and that, that was symbolic of strength and power. 
And in that poetic language, he says, But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of an unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. And it's that last statement I want us to focus on for these minutes together tonight. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. When I first came to Iowa out of Tennessee, I didn't know how to say oil. When I said oil, they, they didn't recognize what I was saying, but over the years I had been reprogrammed, and I know how to say it like you do now. At least I think I do. If not, I'm certainly a lot closer than I was. Oil. It's mentioned, oil is mentioned a couple of hundred times in the Scriptures. It was such an important part of the everyday lives of the people in Bible lands and Bible times. Oil in the Bible most often was a reference to olive oil. It was used for everything from cleansing to cosmetics to cooking. But here the psalmist, David, attaches a spiritual meaning to it, one of consecration. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Sounds like a plan, doesn't it? A man who has a plan. There was resolve, commitment, and focus in David's statement. You know we all live according to a plan. Some folks live by the plan of having no plan, and that's a poor plan. And I cannot afford to leave my spiritual life to chance or to fate. I cannot afford to leave such important matters in the hands of others. I need a pre-planned course of action. While we live in a day when we were encouraged to prearrange for the details of our death. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, I think they call that pre-planning. Where do you want your final resting place? What kind of casket? We have a special this month. A beautiful chartreuse colored casket, velvet lined with a pillow of your choice, with cooling gel and memory foam if you like. It's all part of our layaway plan. It's to die for. Dirt cheap. I have others, but uh, uh, why add to that when I've already said too much? A lot of questions, a lot of issues, pre-planning. Where will the service be? What will be the details of that service? It's good to plan ahead for the one guaranteed event of life, death. What if it's, if it's good to pre-plan for the arrangements of our death, isn't it even more important to plan for how we are going to live? David utters a holy resolve. A mission, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. The beginnings of the new year present us with an opportunity, an optimum moment for a new anointing, fresh oil. And I believe our desire for this fresh oil can be awakened and stimulated as we note the following insights from this psalm, this precious psalm, Psalm 92. First of all, the importance of this experience. And to see how important this experience is, uh, we really need to put it in its historical context. Of course, first of all, in the Old Testament, where the words originate. What is the context in which David understood these words? In Israel, whenever a prophet or a priest or a king would be commissioned for service, they would be anointed with oil as a symbol of being set apart for the work God had called them to do. A symbol showing his need for the blessing and the Spirit of God in order to fulfill his God-given assignment. And we have many examples in the Bible. In Leviticus, Aaron is anointed as priest. In 1 Kings, Elisha is anointed as a prophet. 
In 1 Samuel, David is anointed as a future king. Samuel had been sent to the house of Jesse, David's father. He had been sent there by the Lord himself to look among Jesse's seven sons for God's chosen king. He looked them over, and he didn't see God's appointed one. And so the prophet asked Jesse, he said, are these all your children? And Jesse said, there's one more. He's the youngest. He watches over the sheep. And when the young man was brought in at Samuel's request, the Lord spoke to Samuel's heart, and he said, this is the one. Arise and anoint him. The Bible says, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him from that day forward. That young man was David, the same David that now says, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. And then when you come to the New Testament, you see it still playing out in the most vivid manner. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus began His public ministry with the words, the introductory words in His own hometown church, His own hometown synagogue. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He hath anointed me. And later, Simon Peter writes of how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, it is made clear that all believers have been given this anointing and set apart for service. I have to emphasize that the anointing is not reserved for a privileged few. Those days are over. I don't care what the TV preachers suggest. They don't have anything you can't have, and you don't need them to get it. This anointing is not the exclusive possession of the pastor or the missionary or the televangelist or the so-called prophet so he can make a prophet. It belongs to every believer, and I'm about to prove it. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, John said, but you have an anointing. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 27, John writes, As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. So this anointing is God's Spirit resting on us, working in us, and blessing the world through us. And it belongs to every single believer. It is every believer's prerogative to say, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Secondly, not only the importance of this experience, but the interpretation of this experience. How are we to understand it? What does it mean? Well, as we've seen, anointing is a symbol, first of all, of dedication. When prophets and priests and kings were anointed, it was a symbol of them being set apart for the work God had commissioned them to do. And David surely can't help but reflect back on that time when he was anointed as king, when Samuel took that horn of plenty and poured that oil out on David, and simultaneously the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Now David has lost something, and he wants it back. And he vows this is a new day with new challenges, and I'm not going to live on yesterday's experience. I am consecrating myself afresh and anew to God's holy purposes. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Not only a symbol of dedication, it's a symbol of restoration. David knew that. 
As a shepherd, he knew that. He had seen it many times. In fact, he wrote about it. You know, the shepherd, at the end of the hot, tiring day, would walk through his flock, and he would individually examine the sheep to see if perhaps a sheep had been wounded by a jagged rock or thorny briar, and if so, he would anoint them with healing and soothing oil. And David reflected on that in the 23rd Psalm, thou anointest my head with oil, he restoreth my soul. It's a symbol of restoration. And so I would say to you tonight, are are you weary? Have you been hurt or wounded? The good shepherd walks through the flock looking for the weak and the weary and the wounded. He has fresh oil for you. There is restoration here. You might suspect that you would see evidence of that in this psalm, and indeed you do in verse 10 of Psalm 92. David said, but my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. In verse 12, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. And in verse 13, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of God. Verse 14, they shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. So let the weak and the wounded say, I shall come to my shepherd. I shall let him minister to me. I shall seek his hand of healing and his touch of restoration. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. It was also a symbol of jubilation You see that in the psalm, verse 1. It's a good thing to to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. In verse 4, for thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. In Psalm 45, in verse 7, David says, thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Oh, it must grieve the heart of God and perplex the men of the world and delight the demons of hell to see joyless Christians in joyless churches having joyless services. Sometimes it's like the little girl whose grandfather was a very religious man, and that was the problem. You see, religion has never done anything for anybody except for deceiving them and putting them into bondage. And her grandfather was always so sober and serious, seeking relief from such, such oppressiveness. She went out to the pasture, and she spotted a donkey, a sad-looking creature, and she said, poor little donkey, you've got grandpa's religion too. Well, maybe grandpa needed to be anointed with fresh oil. You're never too old, you know. You never reach the point where you never need a fresh anointing. Oil is the lubrication that keeps the machinery running smoothly. It keeps the bearings from burning out. Several weeks ago, remember when it was really, really cold, we had our winter episode lifted quickly. I stayed away. I'm not complaining. Um... But during that time period, my garage door woke up in a foul mood, and it said, no, not going to do it today, not going to open for you or anybody else. And so being the experienced and insightful mechanic that I am, I called the garage door experts, and a nice fellow came out, and he took out a can of lubrication and good stuff, high-powered hydrocarbon solvent with anti-wear additives. All of that in one can. And he sprayed, and he sprayed, and he sprayed. 
He sprayed the cables and the springs and the hinges and the tracks and the rollers. You're impressed that I know the names of all those parts. I had to look them up. Come to find out, nothing, nothing wrong with the door. It just needed some fresh oil. I was hoping he was going to say, Sir, nice to meet you today. No charge this time. Keep us in mind when there's a problem. Instead, he said, $42, sir. Do you know how many cans of lubrication you can buy for $42? <laughs> <laughs> You know, people can get like that garage door, loud, cranky, fussy, cantankerous. None of, none of them are here tonight because those people don't come on Sunday night. But I'll tell you, let them get anointed with fresh oil, and they quiet right down. They begin to operate in a smooth and cooperative manner. Nothing wrong with them that some fresh oil couldn't fix. Thirdly, not only the importance of these words and the interpretation of these words, but the implication of these words. Now, David's talking about two things. He's talking about God, and he's talking about himself. So there are implications here about both. First of all, God. God is able. He's got the oil, and He's got enough. He's got enough for all of us. No one has ever come to God and heard Him say, whoops, I'm sorry, you're a day late. I just ran out. My resources are depleted. I'm sorry. I just gave out the last bit of oil, so no more anointing. I just saved the last soul, no more mercy. I just healed the last body, no more healing virtue. I just fulfilled the last promise, no more grace. There are no oil shortages with God. There's more than enough for every empty vessel, every aching heart, every needy soul. Now here on earth, they're telling us we're running out of everything. We're running out of oil, we're running out of water, we're running out of food, we're running out of money, we're running out of time. I'm running out of patience listening to them all. God's supply is inexhaustible because God is inexhaustible. In verse 2, His loving kindness and His faithfulness are inexhaustible. Verse 5 and verse 8, His greatness is inexhaustible. In verse 1, His height is inexhaustible. Oh, most high! And in verse 5, his depth is inexhaustible, the profundity of his thoughts. In verse 8, there is no end to his days. And in verse 9, no end to his conquest. So don't worry. He's got what you need, all you need, and more than you need. But there are also implications here about us. You see, this is personal. David starts with David, I. That's a good place to start. In fact, the only place. A lot of folks want to start with you and them and those people. Been many times in my life when I preached a sermon and went out to greet people and somebody would say, man, those people really needed that today. Not too long ago, I preached a sermon on on pride as we were going through the book of James. And after the service, someone asked me, who were you thinking of when you preached that sermon? And I think my answer surprised them. Their question certainly surprised me. Who were you thinking of when you preached that sermon? And I just spoke to them honestly, and I said, me. It's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. No one can stand in for me, no one can take my place, not when it comes to my relationship with God. 
No one can do for me what I must do for myself. I cannot live off of your experience. I can't get the anointing or the fresh oil from you. I have to go to God myself, just like David. It's God and me. In a church in London, there's a bronze tablet with the inscription, Here God laid His hand on William Booth. Now, William Booth was born in poverty, and before social media and cell phones, he became the leader of an army of over two million people dedicated to fighting poverty in the name of Christ. William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army. On one occasion, a man came to that church in London, and he stood at that tablet for a long, long time. And the caretaker of the church wanted to close the church. And he approached the man, and he asked him if he would leave. And the man said, please, just one more minute. His entreaty was so sincere, the caretaker backed away and gave the man his space and his time. And he stood aside, but he heard the man praying. He was pleading. He said, oh God, do it again. Do it again. And that man was William Booth. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Father, I thank you today that that possibility is right in front of us. And I thank you that you never turn us away, that we're never rejected, that we're never sent away empty-handed. I thank you that you're the God of unlimited resources, and you are here tonight to grant to us a fresh touch from heaven. So, Lord, I ask that you'll help us just to remove any obstacles, any distractions, any preoccupations. to renounce and rise above, above any accusations from our enemy, and that the way would be cleared so one man, one woman, one child could come before your throne and receive from you a fresh anointing. It's a plan. It's a good plan. And we thank you, Lord, as we present ourselves, you present yourself. As we draw nigh to you, you draw nigh unto us. As we knock on that door, God himself opens it up and invites us in.